Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today for lesson one, Introduction to IoT. This is part of our Hello IoT series, which we'll be running this week and next week. And I will share a link to our series page in the chat shortly. Before we start, I have a few things to go over. Please take a few minutes to read our code of conduct. We ask that you be respectful to everybody during this and all reactor sessions. If you haven't already, please check in using our event check-in, aka.ms slash reactor check-in with event ID 13421. By checking in, you will, see, you will receive links to today's content for this session. I will also be sharing the link again in the chat in just a few moments. Please ask questions using the live chat. You should see two text boxes with a question mark over the top one. That is the live event Q&A. We will also be sharing some links to the Reactor Meetup pages and monthly newsletters if you are interested in checking out what other sessions we have. Today's session will be added to our Reactor page, Reactor YouTube page in about 24 to 48 hours. So if you join late or if there's something you wanted to follow up on, you can find that there. And then finally, I will share a link to the Reactor survey. If you have a few minutes, we greatly appreciate your feedback. I am now going to pass it over to Jim. Thank you again so much for joining us. Cool, thank you very much. Hello everyone, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to this Hello IoT show. Right, give me a second while I do the thing with the teams to make the screen sharing do the thing. Right, can you see my screen? I'm hoping everyone can see my screen. Cool. So yeah, welcome to this IoT for Beginners series. This is it's an eight part series we're doing with the Microsoft Reactor to go through some of the basics of IoT, start really starting right back at the basics. Now the structure we're doing is we've actually got four lessons over this week and next week mixed in with office hours. So we start today with a lesson, tomorrow office hours, day after lesson, day after office hours. The lessons will actually go through some IoT content, kind of learn about some of the concepts around Internet of Things. And then the office hours are kind of a more open, ask me anything style session, kind of something new that we're trying. And so literally tomorrow's office hours, we won't have much of a structure. It's come with your questions. We can discuss anything around IoT, anything around the lessons we've done today. And then Wednesday back to a lesson, Thursday another uh, another um, office hours session. So to introduce myself, my name is Jim Bennett and I'm an education cloud advocate on the next generation experiences team at Microsoft. So what that means for people who don't speak Microsoft is it's my job to help anybody involved in learning be successful with technology, specifically Microsoft technologies. Whether you're a student, a teacher, you're part of a boot camp, you're, you just wanna learn something in your own time. Anybody's interested in learning content, I'm here to kind of help you around that. I specifically focus on the Internet of Things. So if you've got any questions around IoT, um, how to use that, obviously with Microsoft technologies, then please get in touch. I'm all over the internet at Jim Bob Bennett. So Twitter, GitHub, Instagram, LinkedIn, I'm Jim Bob Bennett on all those platforms. So feel free to get in touch, reach out with any questions that you've got after this session. Now the link, this is going to be dropped in the chat. This is going to be sent if you, once you do the check-in, you'll get sent this link as well. But this is the link to the content we're going to be covering over the next eight sessions, aka.ms slash IoT dash beginners. Now this is a new 24 lesson curriculum that we've been putting together at Microsoft to teach you the Internet of Things from the ground up, literally from the basics. So we put this together, we've, it's fully open source, it's MIT licensed, and it's designed for anybody who wants to learn IoT or wants to teach IoT. And we, we've made it completely free so that if you want to use this in the classroom, you can. If you want to use a study group, you can. There's no cost, there's no limitations. If you like the content but decide, you know what, it's great, but I really want to rewrite it in a different programming language or I want to make adjustments to it, you can. It's free, it's for you to use to help you learn the Internet of Things. It's currently in English, but we're working with a great bunch of folks, including some of our Microsoft Learn student ambassadors, to translate this into multiple different languages. So we've studied on translation into Bengali, Hindi, Indonesian, Chinese, Arabic, Macedonian, Spanish. We've got some folks interested in Japanese and Turkish. So it's not just in English. This is global content that we're creating for you to help you learn IoT. And a huge shout out to any of our student ambassadors who've been involved in translations uh, in this session today. 
thank you, thank you, thank you. We love you. We love the work you're doing. If anyone wants to get involved in translations, please, please join us. It's open source, so Razor PR, translating this content. Now, the idea of IT for Beginners is to teach you the internet of things from the basics using a teaching style based around projects and constant questions, check-ins and visual learning styles. And so we've divided up the 24 lessons into a number of projects. We start with just kind of a basic hello world, light and LED connected to the internet style project, then goes on to farming, transport and logistics, uh, manufacturing, retail and consumer. And it's all based on the journey of food from farm to table. So it's about growing your food, shipping your food to a processing plant, processing it, selling it on shelves, and then cooking it with the aid of a smart timer. And we cover a whole lot of IoT concepts. In the next eight sessions, we're just gonna be touching on the first four lessons, just kind of the hello world of, of IoT. But so there's a lot of great content here. It's all free for you to use. We have projects all the way through. So when you do the farm-based thing, you do um, plant, plant growth monitoring and soil moisture monitoring and automatic watering. For logistics, it's tracking vehicles, visualizing the data with GPS, and then using geofences to get alerts when a vehicle enters an area. For manufacturing, we look at AI on the edge to recognize fruit that's ripe and, and unripe based off um, image classification. For retail, it's object detection, so IT devices to work out whether you have all the things on the shelves where they should be. And then for home use, you actually got a smart timer. So with your voice, you can control a timer, get spoken feedback and do that in multiple languages. So it's all project based and we have constant quizzes. We have sketch notes to kind of help you learn in a visual style, links to videos, links to, to reading and a whole lot of great content. And we are pretty happy with this. We're pretty happy this is great for students. We kind of targeted this at sort of first year, second year of university students. And we're pretty happy that it is, is ideal for that audience because we've been working with students to make sure the content is good. So we've been working with our student ambassadors who've been testing this out, including some folks who've never done IoT before. So, you know, we're pretty happy with the kind of content we've put together. So let's dive right in. We're going to dive in with lesson one. Well, actually, no, sorry, before we dive in, before we dive in, IoT is about devices. The T in IoT is the Internet of Things. So I do need to give a shout out to Seed Studio. They have been working with us to make it easy to buy the hardware you need. Now, we've got three choices of hardware to learn IoT, one of which is virtual hardware. So you don't actually need any hardware at all. What you can do is you can use a tool called Counterfeit where you spin up a virtual IoT device. So you can say, I want a temperature sensor or a camera, buttons, distance sensors, GPS sensors, LEDs, relays, and then access these through code without buying any physical hardware. So if you don't want to spend any money on hardware, We've got you sorted. You can literally simulate all the hardware that you need. If you do want to buy hardware, then Seed have made it easy to buy that by pre-packaging the hardware that we're using. If you go to ak.ms slash IoT hyphen beginners hyphen kit, that will take you to a page where you can actually buy the hardware. So you can buy a pre-packaged kit, different prices depending on which the hardware you've got, but you can buy a pre-packaged kit with all the bit different pieces you need to do all the projects inside this. So if you're a teacher you're, and you need to buy 100 kits for a massive class, you can literally just, uh, you yeah, know, choose 100 kits, buy 100 kits. So let's dive right in. Today's session is all about an, an introduction to IoT. Now, this is going to be me talking through the content, showing you some demos, talking about how it all works. If you have questions, then please, please drop them in the, the chat. Oh, my mouse has disappeared. My mouse does weird things with PowerPoint. If you have any questions, please drop them in the chat. Uh, anything urgent, if you completely miss something, drop it in the chat and you know, I can go back over it. But otherwise, if you have questions, uh, I'll, I'll kind of keep checking the chat every now and again and uh, you know, try and try and give you the answers. Anything that I don't answer today, we can go through tomorrow in the office hours. So today's topics, we're going to talk about what is IoT, talk about some IoT devices around us. We're actually going to set up an IoT device. And then we're going to talk about some of the applications of IoT. So it's all very much going back to beginner level content. So let's start with defining IoT. What is IoT? You hear the expression a lot. What exactly is it? Well, IoT, it means the Internet of Things. And it was a term coined by somebody called Kevin Ashton back in 1999, all about connecting the physical world to the Internet. So it's things, it's devices, and you connect those either to the internet directly, or you build networks of these things that kind of talk to each other 
in a mesh. And these things would interact with the physical world using sensors to gather data or using actuators to do some kind of inter interaction going back. So when we talk about things like sensors and actuators, what we mean is a sensor is a device that senses the physical properties of the real world. For example, it will measure temperature, humidity, air pressure, vibration, sound. And then IoT devices can then give feedback using actuators, which are devices that do something, such as turn on a switch, light a light, make a noise. So IoT is all about bringing these things together. And you can kind of think of it as a large ecosystem. So you have all these devices, it's usually not just one device. You normally have a load of different devices that gather this data, give you this feedback via actuators, and then connect with other devices, some of them on the cloud, some of them not in the cloud. And once you've got this, all these devices working together, you then have kind of the data side of it, the analytics, and you start looking at what you do, you know, what you can kind of do with the data that comes from these devices. So you think about it as so it's more than just devices, because the T side of things, the things is other devices. The I side of things is the internet. It's the cloud, it's the processing. And so you have these things, they gather data from sensors, they send this data to the cloud. You then have all these cloud services that process the data. The, the decisions are made and then things can be sent back to the device to control and actuate to kind of do something in response to that data. So the canonical example, the one I love to give is a smart thermostat. And so I have a thermostat, measures the temperature in my house, sends that data to the cloud, I can access it from my phone, and then the cloud service can make a decision about controlling my heating and cooling system in my house. It could be it says, yeah, house is too hot, turn on the aircon. It could be it says, house is too hot, but I've checked your calendar, you're on vacation, I won't turn on the aircon, things like that. So the cloud services make decisions based off the data from the devices. Now you don't actually have to put services in the cloud. There is this idea of edge processing, which we'll kind of look at a bit a bit later on in the next next couple of weeks. But edge processing is all about taking the cloud services and running those on computers close to your data. And so you run um, an edge service would be an AI service trains the cloud, but it's running on a computer on the same network as your IoT devices. That way, your IoT devices can have the data analyzed without relying on internet connectivity in areas such as humanitarian disaster zones or uh, up the ships in the middle of the sea, or they don't, um, so you don't have to worry about connectivity, or they can process your data without worrying about privacy, you know, sending medical data up to the cloud. Uh, cool, is the seed, sorry, just one of the questions, is the seed kit available in India? Uh, yes, as far as I know, they're shipping globally. Um, we have ordered some kits from Seed before for some of our student ambassadors in India and they have received them. So Seeds, they're based in, uh, I think it's in Shenzhen in China and they do ship globally. So yes, it is available globally. Okay, now, as I said, IoT gathers data and data is kind of the key to IoT success. This is kind of the big part about IoT is we gather data, we do things with the data, we make decisions with the data. Now, IoT is growing really, really fast. You know, the, the estimation was by the end of last year, 30 billion devices were connected gathering data, which is, you know, that's a lot of devices. But in terms of the amount of data they're actually gathering, the estimation is by the end of 2025, IoT devices will be gathering 80 zettabytes of data. And that is 80 trillion gigabytes of data. Yeah, that's more than the entirety of human written knowledge times 100,000 million, whatever. It's a huge, huge, huge amount of data. It's being gathered by devices. This is temperature sensors in people's houses. It's vibration sensors on machines in factories, soil moisture readings from farms. And so kind of a question, something to think about, maybe check your answers in the chat, maybe something we can talk about more tomorrow in the office hours. We're creating all this all this data, you know, it's going to be 80 zettabytes soon. But how much of it do we actually use? So, and how much is wasted? Yeah, there's obviously, some of it can be used, some of it is irrelevant, some of it can be used, we don't use it. So kind of think about that, Think, try and see if we can find out how much data we, we use, how much we waste, and then think of some ideas about how we can be better with our data. If we're gathering all this data and just throwing it away, what can we do better? 
we could either not gather it or could we be more efficient with it? So a little bit of homework for everybody. We can talk about this some more uh, tomorrow in the office hour session, but how can we do better with our data? So let's take a moment to talk about devices. Let's dive dig a bit into actual devices that you might use as an IoT developer. So the T in IoT is things, internet of things, and things refers to these devices that interact with the physical world. Now, when we're building IoT devices, you kind of divide it into two kind of sections. There's developer kits that we as developers would use to learn IoT to kind of build the first version of a device. And then you have the production devices, the ones you would actually make and sell. And there's usually a difference between the two. Not always, but there usually is. So as developers, we use developer kits. And these are general purpose devices that are tailored for developers. They're bigger, they're more expensive, they have a lot of features that you probably wouldn't have in a production device. For example, you get a whole lot of exposed pins that you can use for input output. So things you can connect sensors and actuators to on the device. They may have things like debug hardware, so you can actually debug it while it's running. They may have additional sensors. You can buy you know, a dev kit that has temperature sensors, LEDs, you know, other bits and pieces, microphones, headphone sockets, whatever, that you wouldn't necessarily use in production but that they come with all these sensors because you know they don't know what you're going to use in production the dev kit will have a lot of things and you know when you when you go to production you'll just need some of those bits and pieces but you have the dev kits you can try them all out when it comes to actually production deployments when you're building something it's usually custom made for the environment that's being used in so you wouldn't take a, a raspberry pi for example necessarily a full-on raspberry pi and then deploy a hundred thousand of those in a factory what you would do is you'd usually build a custom circuit boards, maybe even custom CPUs. You would add just the bits and pieces that you need and you would make whatever hardware changes you need to suit your use. So, for example, if you've got vibration sensors, you know, the kind of vibration sensor you'd play with at home is, is good, but it wouldn't last in a factory measuring vibration, you know, with the temperature, the heat, you know, the dust we're having in a factory measuring vibration 24 hours a day for 10 years. It just wouldn't do it. So instead, you'd get ruggedized versions. You get industrial versions of it. Um, oh, sorry, my camera's going weird. Hello, focus. Come on, focus on my camera. There we go. Um, sorry, that was really confusing. I just saw a little picture of myself. So everything went blurry. It's very, very, very strange. So yeah, so development. You have dev kits with all the bits that you play with, production devices are usually custom made. So you kind of finalize your device under the developer kit and then use a custom made production device. Now dev kits kind of fall into two categories. They have their microcontrollers or um, MCUs, microcontroller units. Top tip, do not search for MCU and expect to get anything to do with IoT devices because it's the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You search for MCU, you get Iron Man rather than Arduino devices. Um, but they're microcontrollers, and then you have the single board computers. So microcontrollers are designed for a single task. They run one thing. Um, the one you may have heard of, you've heard of the Arduino framework, Arduino hardware, those are microcontroller based. And they're good for running kind of one thing and one thing only and doing it very fast. Single board computers, on the other hand, are more multitasking. They're literally a computer on a small board and they do the same thing that your desktop computer would do. So looking at a microcontroller, what kind of is a microcontroller? So these are low cost, low power computing devices, often with some basic sensors and actuators, and they are relatively low cost. So in, if you buy a washing machine, you'll have some microcontrollers in it. And the cost of those can be, you know, I think 50 US cents is the average cost of a microcontroller these days. The cheapest ones you can get are, are I think, three cents, three US cents. And the, the, these are kind of production ones. Developer kits can start for less than four US dollars for kind of basic hardware, and the costs go up as you add more features. So, for example, there's one. Let me just zip over to a camera. I mean, here's one here. This is a Wii terminal. This is about 30 US dollars. It's a microcontroller inside here. It's got sockets on the back here to plug stuff in. You've got sockets on the bottom to plug in sensors and actuators little joystick, screen, microphone, buttons on top, SD card socket, and you kind of look about 30 bucks for those. Whereas if you want to go you know, a lot cheaper, for say one or two dollars, you can get something like a Raspberry Pi Pico. Turn your little microcontroller, 
this doesn't have Wi-Fi, got like a button and an LED on it, and then a whole lot of pins for plugging more hardware. So you kind of you pay different amounts for what you want. You know, you can get devices like this, ESP32. It's got Wi-Fi, pins, LEDs, magnetic sensor, buttons. You know, and then for a few more dollars, you can get something like this, which doesn't have Wi-Fi, but has Bluetooth, has microphone, accelerometer. So you kind of get a range of these different kits and it all depends on kind of what you want to do with them. Now they're they're very low powered. They're designed to be limited to a very specific set of, of oops, sorry, very limited set of tasks. So you just you program one thing in them and it runs that one thing. That's it. You program it to do one job, and it runs that one job. Don't usually have an operating system. If they do, it's a very lightweight operating system. And in terms of performance, we're talking, you know, megahertz, not gigahertz. We're talking kilobytes of RAM, not megabytes or gigabytes of RAM. So they're kind of very low power. We'll dive a lot more into these devices on Wednesday session. They have single board computers. These are small general purpose, fully featured computers. Canonical example, one I love is the Raspberry Pi. Here's a Raspberry Pi here. It is a quad core 1.5 gigahertz processor computer. It's got, this one's got four gigs of RAM, goes up to eight gigs of RAM. We've got pins here to plug in sensors, USB sockets, Ethernet sockets, camera sockets, two HDMI ports, USB-C power, microphone, SD card for storage. Yeah, this is a proper full computer. And you get, Raspberry Pi is kind of one of the, the most famous ones. You've probably heard a lot of those. You get other different devices, but they have all the things. So microcontroller just has like CPU, bit of memory, bit of IO. Single board computer, it's got things like a graphics chip, so you can plug in a monitor. It's got things like the USB ports and SD cards and other things. And it is closer to a desktop device. And when I say closer to a desktop device, I mean, I literally mean this here is a Raspberry Pi 400. It's the same as, so it's one of them, but in a box with a keyboard. All the ports on the back, and I can plug this into a monitor and a mouse, and I've got a fully featured computer. Anybody who's old like me and grew up with Commodore 64, ZX Spectrums, things like that, this is the new version of that. You literally, you plug this in to your monitor, keyboard, uh, monitor and mouse, and away you go. You've got a full computer going. Now, in terms of, of operating systems, microcontrollers don't want an OS, or if they do, it's very thin. This runs a full operating system. So Raspberry Pi runs Linux. And because it runs Linux, you can use anything that you can use on Linux with it. So you can program it in uh, Java, .NET, JavaScript, Go, Rust, C++, Python, kind of any programming language that supports on Linux, you can run on a Raspberry Pi. And Python kind of is the, the typical programming language that you use. And saying it's it's like it runs Linux, I'm just gonna zip over here. Uh, where'd it go? Uh, lost my VNC connection, one second. So this is, this is a Raspberry Pi that's running. Let's go sit back to my camera. So there's a Raspberry Pi here, it's running here, and I've connected to it via VNC, and this is my screen. So it's running a web browser, it's running Visual Studio Code. It's a full Linux computer. Yeah, it's not as fast as the Mac I'm using, for example, to present this, but it's a full Linux computer. Now, in terms of the curriculum, Say so we've got three hardware choices. So microcontroller, single board computer, and then a virtual single board computer. That's what we've built for this for this curriculum. In terms of the microcontroller, we're doing the Arduino framework, which is probably the most famous microcontroller developer kit for people who are learning the Internet of Things. So Arduino, it's named after a bar in Italy where they came up with the idea of of uh, running this this of setting this all up and running this company. It's it's devices you can buy. It's a whole C++ framework. So you write C++ code, use that to program your microcontroller. So if you want, if you want to do this curriculum using a physical uh, uh, microcontroller, it's the Wii terminal. So it's this little device here. That's that's the hardware choice for that. If you want to do it using um, a single board computer, we're going down the Raspberry Pi route. We're also supporting a virtual device. So tomorrow in the office, I was going to kind of talk you through and show you the virtual device idea and a bit more. But that's where you write code on your local machine to simulate the same code you'd write in a Raspberry Pi and you'd access sensors via this kind of web interface. So those are the options that we're doing for um, 
for actually developing with this curriculum. So if you want to actually work through it, those are the hardware choices. And this is all based off Visual Studio Code. So you can actually program microcontrollers with VS Code. We'll look at that in, in a bit. In, uh, we can do single board computers by using VS Code and obviously virtual device you're doing locally. So let's actually set up a device. Let's actually see some of this in action. Let's set up our Arduino device and actually show you how to get going with them. And if we get time at the end uh, today, we'll do a similar setup in Raspberry Pi. If not, we can do that tomorrow. So when you develop with microcontroller uh, using Arduino, it's in C and C++. So it's, yeah, it's, these are low power devices. They need programming languages that will squeeze every ounce of power out of the machine. And so it's all C, C++, very low level coding. In terms of IDE, uh, Arduino do have an IDE, which is great. It's free. It's not as full featured as some of the tools you may be used to using. And it's things like the way it does library management. You have, um, you know, you have to kind of know what libraries you have to add if you want to add third party Arduino libraries into your code and things like that. It's, it's, it's OK. Uh, they are working on a new and improved version of it, which is coming out at some point. I think beta versions are available. But Arduino ID, you may have come across that before. You can use that working through this curriculum if you want to, uh, if you've done, if you used Arduino before. We recommend VS Code with Platform IO. It's, I find it a much nicer environment, has a lot of features that Arduino doesn't have. Little things like be able to right click on something and go to the definition and actually navigate inside the, the source code files for the libraries you're using. Um, library management by Putting, it, putting the libraries you're using in an any file, which means I can take a Platform IO project, give it to you, you could launch it, and you wouldn't need to add any libraries. It does all the whole thing, um, the whole thing for you. Um, and so, well, before we set that up, just seen a link in the question. What's linked to Counterfeit website to simulate IoT sensors? Yep, great question. So Counterfeit is not something that runs in the cloud. It's something that you run locally. Uh, so you would go to, there's a GitHub repo, Counterfeit IoT. Uh, that's got links to everything with all the instructions there. You basically install it as a Python package. So you pip install Counterfeit and then you run the Counterfeit app and there's, that runs locally. You'll see here, uh, mine's running on localhost. So you run it locally and then you connect, um, you connect from your IoT device or your, your, your computer, whatever, to this running somewhere on your network. So I, I would run this locally here and then when I write my, my code behind it, I would say connect to localhost on port 5000. But if I wanted to say code on a Raspberry Pi without hardware, as long as my Pi is on the same network, I could then point it to my my Mac on port 5000 and it would work. So it's not a web, it's not an online service. It is one you have to install. So github.com slash counterfeit. In fact, let me see. Can I? There we go. Uh, another question, can you play with MicroPython on Wii O Terminal? Yes, MicroPython and CircuitPython are supported on the Wii O Terminal. Uh, I've gone down the C, C++ route because there's more libraries available in C and C++. There's more samples. There's more online support for C and C++. MicroPython is well supported, but not as well as C and C++. Um, so the Wii O Terminal, the page for it here, it supports I mean, where's the, it's got, the, just looking for the thing that tells you what's, um, yeah, MicroPython, RGPy, CircuitPython. So it supports all the different, all the different variants, but just most of the libraries are um, C and C++. Uh, so it's just kind of easier to go down that path than go on the MicroPython path. Great question, though. Great question. Uh, so yes, I was going to set up a set up my Wii terminal using Platform IO. So this is Visual Studio. Sorry, Visual Studio Code. If you haven't come across VS Code before, it's probably the world's most popular developer text editor. It's a lightweight text editor. It's free. It's mainly open source. The core of this is open source. The only things that are not open source are things like the Microsoft uh, logos, which are copyrights. Um, and we have some telemetry in here to track usage so we understand what features the application people are using. And our telemetry code is, is um, closed source. But other than that, the bulk of it, everything else is fully open source. And it's an extension based 
editor. So I can go into extensions and install extensions to add extra features to VS Code. So I can go in here and I can search for a thing called Platform.io. And this is a free microcontroller develop, embedded development tool. Comes from, so it's not, not, it's not from Microsoft, it's from a company called Platform.io and it's completely free. And this brings a whole load of microcontroller capabilities into VS Code. So it brings in all, it depends on C, the C and C++ extension from Microsoft. So it brings in IntelliSense, code navigation, com uh, code completion, all that for C and C++. But it, then it supports all the microcontroller development you could possibly want. And what's really nice about this is it brings all the tools in in an isolated way. So in the, in the past, I've done microcontroller development on a number of different types of boards. And I find that you install the developer kit for one board. And then when you install developer kit for another board, it installs a different thing somewhere else that breaks the first board. And so you're forever trying to get the right configuration working for multiple different boards. This installs each one in a separate isolated way. So everything just works. You can change boards, it just works. I've never had any problems with conflicts and setups or you know the wrong GCC compiler or what have you. This just keeps everything working nicely. It's completely free and I love it to bits. It supports a whole lot of different hardware platforms. It supports the Arduino framework and a whole lot of other frameworks. So the other kind of frameworks you can use for microcontrollers includes kind of production frameworks, um, you know, ones designed for specific hardware types. There's a few um, OSs, real-time operating systems, which are OSs for microcontrollers, which are very small, very thin. You know, it's not like a, not like Mac OS or Windows with all the window management and uh, you know networking and, and file shares and searching and voice agents and you know photo management and all that is literally very thin, very lightweight. A little bit of multi-threading, a little bit of networking, and kind of that's about it. Um, so this supports a whole of these different frameworks. You know, embed for ARM processors or STM32 cube for STM devices. Things like that. Yes, thousand different boards it supports, a whole lot of different stuff. It supports debugging and, and all that kind of good stuff. So you, you search the extension and install it, and away you go. And once it's installed, you get this lovely little bug icon, really nice icon. And from here, you can create a new project. So I'm going to just spin up a quick Weo terminal project. New project. I'm going to call this one Nightlight. Reason for calling it Nightlight is over the next few lessons, I'm actually going to take this and expand on it and build out an internet controlled Nightlight. Then choose my hardware. 1,028 boards available. It's a ridiculous amount of hardware that they support. Search for Wio, and I want the Seedduino Wio terminal. That's what I want. Well, Arduino. And then this will go away. This will download all the tool chains, frameworks, libraries, and all that that it needs. In my case, it's instant because I've uh, You've done, I've done this before, so it's already got the stuff downloaded. And then when this gets installed, this is kind of very different from what you'd get if you used the Arduino IDE. So in the Arduino IDE, when you create it, you get a sketch file, which is a single file that's got some, some code in there that you run on your device. And we can go through the code in a bit more detail um, tomorrow. But essentially, there's just a little bit of Arduino code that it runs that makes things work. And that would not say normally sit in a sketch file. And then if you can, if you want to bring in other files, you kind of add them to the folder of the sketch file. There. Here, things are a little bit different. So first of all, you have this platformio.ini file, and this allows you to support multiple types of hardware from your project. So this is set up for my Wii terminal, the platform, the board, Arduino framework. And in here, I can add library dependencies. I can say I want to support. Um, the Arduino JSON to bring in JSON support, for example, and that would then build it, bring in the code and compile it as I need it. And because in this any file, if I give this folder to you via, yeah, upload to GitHub, give it to you, you, you then start building it, it would then download the library for you. So you kind of got this library management. But also, if I wanted to support four or five different platforms, I could literally replicate this different environments for different platforms. My same code, I can say compile it for this platform, this platform, this platform. And it means as well I have different library dependencies. So I might use the seed SD card library on one platform or the Arduino one on a different platform. So it kind of gives me a nice amount of configuration. Uh, these dot folders, we can ignore those. Um, they're just pre, uh, where you build caches and stuff like that. The include folder is where you can bring in header files if you're adding additional libraries. If you want a whole library that's using, it's not pre-compiled, you can drop in the lib folder. 
test folder for unit tests, and then source is where the main source of your application lives. And here, instead of being in an inno file, if you if you've done Arduino IDE, they're .ino files. This is a .cpp, it's a proper C++ file. So if you've done, if you used Arduino IDE before, when you move to Platform.io, one thing to be aware of is the main CPP file is a proper C++ file and therefore follows all the rules of full C++. Now, which means your code has to be ordered the right way so it knows about it. If this was in the Arduino IDE, I could declare a function down here and call it from my setup or my loop. You can't do that in, in full C++. So, you know, if you if you copy an Arduino sketch file in here, you may get compiler errors because you may need to rearrange your code. But this is the this is the code we've got here. Um, now, inside this, we have these two functions, setup and loop, and this is what makes the Arduino framework work. So normally in C++, you would have a int main function. That would be the entry point of your application. That's the code that you run. You don't get that in Arduino, that's buried somewhere in the Arduino framework. Instead, you get setup, which you put, as it says in the helpful comment, you put your setup code here to run once. When your device boots, it runs your setup code. And then your loop is your main application. This is like an event loop. And so after setup gets called, loop gets called, and then a loop is called again and again and again and again. So loop is literally run repeatedly, constantly run, 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 run. So your device launches, runs setup once, runs loop again and again and again. And this is where you put your logic, you know, state management to work out what you want to do, that kind of stuff. So let's actually write a basic Hello World app in here. So first thing I'm going to do, I'm just going to adjust the, oh, adjust the number of spaces and format my code to make it a bit easier to read. First thing I'm going to do is set up the serial connection. So on my weird terminal, Turns it back to oh, my camera. On the weird terminal, USB C port here. So this can provide power uh, to the device, but also because the USB port, this is how I connect it to my to my computer and actually program the device. So if I plug in like a you know, plug in a USB C cable that's connected to my to my Mac, uh, I can actually send data back across here. So the way I would do logging, debugging, that kind of thing is I would connect this and then send data over the serial cable. So, just questions. Uh, so let me just take, take up the questions before I carry on. Is IoT development possible with JavaScript? Yes, yes it is. There's a load of different frameworks you can, you can use for IoT with JavaScript. Uh, there's a load of devices that do support IoT. Uh, microcontrollers, I've not seen JavaScript running on microcontrollers, but Raspberry Pis, yep, JavaScript, you can, uh, you can do it on there, no problem. Uh, does work for Raspberry Pi as well? Does, sorry, does what work for Raspberry Pi? Um, yeah, sorry, can you just clarify just what you mean by does it work for Raspberry Pi? And I can answer that. Adding more add-ons in MS Code can make it slow. No, nope, adding extensions to VS Code does not make it slow. The extensions only, only get run when you call them. So you can add as many extensions here as you like. I have loads, a few more in there doesn't doesn't slow down VS code at all. It's it's lightweight, it's super fast, and the extensions only get called when you do something. Like if you load a, load up a, a file for the first time, it might load the extension for that file type. And um, yeah, obviously, yes, you can get extensions that will slow it down because the extensions are badly written, but I've never noticed any slowdown from any any add-ons. Okay, cool. I think that's I think I've got all the questions. Cool. Um, no, great questions. Appreciate that. So to get this, to get the serial connection working, to actually get messages coming across down my USB cable, I need to actually tell it to start the serial connection. So I say I want to begin this and then 960. This is what's called the board rate. So that's how fast it is. So this will send 9,600 bytes every second down the serial connection. So that tells it how fast it's going to communicate. And now that can take a fraction of a, of a second to work. So what you normally do is you'd have a little loop, an infinite loop, it just waits until the serial connection is connected. And then it's good to just chuck a little short delay on the startup just to make sure we're all happy and not, uh, in terms of debugging via the serial port, we're all working. And then what I'm going to do in my loop, in our setup, just added the code to set the serial connection. In my loop, I'm actually going to write something to serial connection. So I'm going to serial.println print line that will write a line of text with a new line character at the end 
hello iot there we go and now i'm going to add a delay so this will then sleep for 5000 milliseconds or five seconds so the code i've written here if you're not used to c code don't worry about it it's, it should be fairly self-explanatory uh, yes, you do have to use semicolons on the end. It's one of those languages that requires semicolons. But this is saying there's a method called setup. We begin the serial port at a speed of 9,600 characters a second, wait for it to start working, and then delay to sleep for one second, 1,000 milliseconds. Then in our loop, we print out to the serial port, so to the serial cable, hello IoT, and then we delay five seconds. And then this gets run again and again and again and again. So now, just to prove this all works, with Platform AI, I can build this. And that will then kick off a compiler, C++ compiler. It'll bring in the various tool chains. It'll download any libraries it's got, compile up the Arduino framework for the Weo terminal. So it's doing now, build the code. We're done, we're built. And now I have to actually deploy it to my device. So if you're used to languages like Python where you just kind of run it, C++ is not like that. You have to actually build it and then deploy it to the device to run it. So I'm going to deploy it to my Weo terminal. Now, before I do, I'm just going to point out an important thing. On the side of the weird terminal here, there's a power button. When it's up, it's off. When it's the middle, it's on. But when it's on, you can't upload to it. You have to put it into like a bootloader mode. So you have to double tap the button down twice. And when you do that, these lights at the bottom, I don't know if you can see it very well, but that blue light should, will pulse. You just do that. I might, might be able to see that very well. That blue light is, uh, yeah, I'm not sure it's coming very well with the camera. That blue light is pulsing gently, which says it's in upload mode. And you have to do that before you upload the code. Now you can do the, up, if you do the upload, it will do the build for you anyway, straight away. So you can do it in one step. Um, I'm just doing it in two, just to kind of show you how it works. So that builds, that's not loads, waiting for the port. And that's copied everything over. And then if I bring up the serial monitor, there we go. So this is now connected. So this is listening. So from my Mac, <coughs> I'm listening across the, the, the USB cable. Signal's coming through here from the IT device, down the cable, into here. And so it's saying, hello, IoT. So I've kind of got my first microcontroller application, my first IoT application running on a microcontroller. Which is pretty cool. So that's kind of showing how we get started with a microcontroller. Uh, tomorrow, uh, yeah, we, we won't get time today, but tomorrow during, during the office hours, I'll, I'll replicate the same thing. I'll show you how to get started with the Raspberry Pi and with uh, the virtual IoT device. So we'll do that tomorrow. So we've, seen, we've talked about, we've introduced IoT, we talked about how it's uh, devices that have sensors to gather data in the physical world, actuated to interact back with the physical world. We've talked about gathering data, how that's managed in the cloud. We've looked at some developer devices, some dev kits, Arduino, we've talked about Arduino, we've talked about single computers. Um, we've kind of seen how to get started with an Arduino device. Let's actually now talk about the applications of IoT. Let's talk about why we're doing this. Why do we even care about this? What things can we use IoT for? And really this covers kind of four, four main groups of things. Um, Sorry, let me just jump back to some questions before I dive into this. Uh, does Platform IO work for Raspberry Pi? No. So Platform IO is for embedded devices. It is for um, your microcontrollers. It's so you can pile up C++ code and then push that to an embedded device like a microcontroller. You don't need to use Platform IO for a Raspberry Pi. So you can you can install Visual Studio Code on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, I'm now, I'll show you. So I've, my little Raspberry Pi that's running here, I've got Visual Studio Code running out. So I can literally run VS Code on my Raspberry Pi if I want to. Uh, there's also a remote extension where you can launch Visual Studio Code on your Mac, with, uh, Windows device, Linux device, what have you, launch VS Code, and then connect to your Pi via an SSH connection and remotely code on your Pi. So you don't need Platform IO to do this. You can do it all from uh, either directly on the Pi VS Code or from the VS Code remote extension. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty cool that if you wanted a great IoT developer experience, then you get a Raspberry Pi 400 like this. You install VS Code on it, you plug this into your monitor, plug in a mouse, and away you go. 
Um, do you need to have a programming background to complete this course? It would help, certainly would help. If you want to work through this, if you want to learn IoT, uh, you don't want to buy any hardware, you can use the virtual IT device, it's all Python based. You can just copy and paste the code. We give you all the code you need to do. Uh, you can, can just copy and paste it. Obviously, it'll be good if you understand a little bit about how the code works. The, if you're doing microcontroller, you do want to have some C, C++ background because the code is going to be very confusing if you don't. If you're doing the Python one, most of the code should be self-explanatory. Uh, we do have some great intro to Python courses. Uh, I'll try and drop those in the chat later, but we have some great intro to Python courses uh, that can kind of get you started with the basis of Python. And we don't use complex Python code. It's all very kind of beginner level uh, Python code um, that's used to us. So no, you don't, yeah. If you want to just understand, you can just read through it and understand the concepts. We teach a lot of concepts here. This is not just all hands-on coding. So you could read through it and just ignore the, the labs to learn the concepts if you wanted to. But if you want to see it in action, then you do want to write some code, but you can just copy and paste the Python code to see it in action and just kind of not worry about it. Cool, I think that's cool, the questions. Yeah, so let's talk about the, the, the applications of IoT. So there's kind of four broad groups that IoT fits into. There's consumer IoT, commercial IoT, industrial IoT, and then infrastructure IoT. Starting small and kind of getting bigger in terms of the, the devices, device usage. So a bit of research for you, a bit of homework for you. We can talk about this in the office house tomorrow, but have a look at these areas and try and find some examples of things that we, we don't list. See if there's any more examples you can kind of come up with and Think about do you have any IoT applications that you use? You probably have a lot and you may not even think about it. So something to, uh, to think about as well, just ready for tomorrow's office hours is what are you know, find some more examples of the different areas and if there's any IoT apps you use. But let's look into these areas. So let's start with consumer. Consumer IoT devices. These are the IoT devices that you have around your home. And you you probably have lots. You might not even realize you have lots. Your mobile phone is an IoT device. It is gathering data from sensors and sending it to the cloud, whether it's tracking location or what have you, it's an IoT device. If you have any kind of smart speakers, so um, Amazon Echoes, uh, Google Home devices, anything like that, that is an IoT device. Robotic vacuum cleaners. I had one for about three days. It was rubbish. It couldn't find its way back home. Um, so, I got, so I returned it. But if robotic, robotic vacuum cleaners, my thermostat, my thermostat is an IoT device. I can control it from my phone anywhere in the world. My my oven, in theory, is an IoT device, but I can't reset the Wi-Fi, so I can't connect it to my uh, my my, uh, my home Wi-Fi. But if I could, I could actually use my voice on Alexa to put my oven on. My fridge is supposed to be Wi-Fi and supposed to alert me when it's open, which it seemed to fail to do last night because my freezer wasn't shut properly and all my ice cream melted. Um, but you've got things like health monitors, Fitbits, anything like that. These are all IoT devices. And some of them are just fun devices. Some of them really help empower people, especially persons with a disability. Whether that's a permanent disability, temporary disability or a situational disability, they can be phenomenally powerful. One classic example is my garage door is connected to the internet and I can control it with an, with an Echo device. So I can say, Alexa, shut my garage door. And what's really cool about this is if I had a disability to make it hard to actually press the little tiny buttons to control it, my voice would help me. But if I had a situation with disability, such as I've got hands full of shopping, I can use my voice to, sh to shut the door. So it's incredibly empowering for people with, with disabilities. If, read, sometimes reading the small displays on an oven can be hard, but if you can use your voice to control it on an IoT device, you've got a lot more power. So consumer devices are fantastic for supporting people around the home. And you've probably got, so you probably got loads of consumer IT devices all around you. And I, I did a quick count and I had 19 devices that support voice control. And yeah, that's just supporting voice control. In terms of IT devices, I have got, I hate to think, these lights behind me are all IoT controlled. My daughter's got a fan in her room she can which we can control over, over the internet. So um, temperature sensors and humidity sensors, so many things. There's a lot of consumer IoT devices. Now, one downside to consumer IoT is everybody's jumping on the consumer IoT bandwagon and therefore they're doing very bad things. They're making devices without security, without privacy. And we'll, we'll look at this a lot more in the next few lessons. Um, but just be wary of consumer IoT devices gathering data they shouldn't, doing things they shouldn't. 
Just actually one more example of how empowering consumer IoT devices are. My daughter has been virtual schooled for the past year and a bit due to COVID. She has to manage her time. So the teacher will say, right, we can take a 10 minute break. Be back online at five minutes past 10. She uses an echo to set her an alarm for five minutes past 10. So she knows to go back. So she's been able to control her time and manage her life a lot better, which is pretty impressive for an eight year old by using these different IoT devices. So it's pretty fantastic. So that's in the home. Then you kind of move to commercial IoT, which is kind of in buildings, the workplace, things like that. And this is where you get things like occupancy sensors. You know, turning lights off, there's nobody in the room, saving electricity. Safety monitoring. Yeah, you know, are people wearing hard hats? Are they wearing masks in buildings that require mask usage? You can use IoT devices, lots of IoT devices, lots of cameras all around that don't film what you're doing. They're just tracking, are you wearing a hard hat? If there's a, a head with no hard hat, they can do an alert. Um, temperature tracking, you know, things like is if you're in a, a supermarket, is the temperature correct on the freezers? You know, my home freezer, the temperature wasn't correct last night and all my ice cream melted. But in a, um, in a supermarket, if the temperature goes too high, it could spoil a whole lot of food. And if it happens overnight and comes back down again during the day and nobody notices, that could be a problem. So constant temperature monitoring is, is important. Vehicle tracking. In countries like New Zealand, you pay tax for diesel vehicles per mile of public road that you drive at a rate based on the weight of the vehicle. So if you're driving, say, 10 miles on public roads to a logging site, four miles to the actual logging area, load your truck up at logs, four miles back to the public road, then 10 miles of public road, you've driven 28 miles, but only 20 miles you have to pay tax on. And so tracking that can be incredibly useful for saving trucking companies money, knowing where vehicles are, seeing where things have been stolen. So there's a huge amount of stuff happening with commercial IoT. Scaling up from there, we get to industrial IoT. Things like predictive maintenance, measuring the vibration of machinery in a factory. If it's vibrating at this amount, it's fine. But if it starts vibrating more, then there's a potential problem. So you can alert based off the vibration, the heat, the no noise, and use that to maybe predict that, okay, a part X will fail in about a week's time, so let's replace that. So there's a lot of stuff you can do, putting millions of sensors in big factories. Farming is using it as well. Things like growing degree days, measuring temperature to get an idea of how much plants have grown to predict when harvest is going to be ready. Automated watering, tracking how, how moist the soil is. And if it's not moist enough, watering the plants at the right time, combined with data such as weather data. So if the ground is too dry, but it's going to rain tonight, don't bother watering, things like that. And safety monitoring. So there's a whole lot of things they can do to kind of really scale this up. And this is kind of where you can get massive factories with millions of IoT devices measuring every little thing of every single machine to get an idea of what's going on. This is kind of where you get your, you know, your zettabytes of data because they can put a whole load of sensors across machines all around the um, industrial factories. And then finally, as we get bigger on a more um, political scale almost, you get things like smart grids and smart cities. Monitoring things like transport. Yeah, I don't know if any of you have ever been driving down a, a motorway that's got temporary speed limits and suddenly you get like a 40 mile hour zone and you're driving along at 40. It's like, why am I driving at 40? There's nothing here. There's no traffic. And then a bit later on, you go back up to 70. Like, what, what was that all about? What that was is somebody was monitoring the transport grid as a whole using IoT devices to, to monitor the speed of vehicles. And they found that there was a slowdown. So by slowing down vehicles that were approaching, they could actually wait for the traffic to clear and everyone travels faster. Parking. It's, there's some places you actually see little lights to tell you whether there's parking spaces available. Um, the Microsoft campus near me. If I, if I drive to a building, it tell me how many parking spaces on each floor. It's great. Pollution tracking. They're monitoring what air pollution is like. Where, where I live, I'm in Washington state uh, in the US, and recently we had a massive heat wave. And people were measuring the temperature difference on streets with trees versus no trees using just temperature sensors and gathering data to show that you need trees to help keep your cities cool. And so there's a load of stuff you can do to monitor and control global infrastructure. Downside to this is kind of that the hackability nature. Uh, recently had some issues in the US where uh, pipe, a pipeline was taken offline because the IoT device was um, on there and the whole network that controlled it was insecure. So if you're monitoring at kind of a global scale or city scale, country scale, security becomes very, very important. So just think, think about yourself, just think about consumer devices. Just take a moment, just to kind of 
think about your house. Have a look around your room, where you are, what have you. Think about some of the IoT devices you may have. Yeah, I say I've got in my kitchen, I've got a fridge, uh, washing machine, no, not washing machine, washing machine is not indicated. Fridge and oven that is internet connected. My microwave connects to my oven. Um, so if I could get my oven internet connected, the time on my oven will be set by the internet and then that would then connect to my microwave and set the time on my microwave. Um, yeah, my daughter can turn on her TV with her voice. She loves that. You know, yeah, Alexa, turn on my TV. She loves it, loves that. So, you know, we've got TVs, we've got music systems, we've got power sockets, we've got lights. I mean, I've got, I can just press buttons here and the lights behind me will start changing colors. Um, you know, I've got a doorbell. Uh, where if somebody there goes change colours, let me do that again, change the colour again. Um, you know, we've got a doorbell where if somebody rings my doorbell, I can just open up my phone and I can talk to them from anywhere in the world. Uh, you know, I've got a large number of echoes unplugged because I just don't use them. I've got, you know, there's so many IT devices around me that are gathering data. I've got the temperature sensor is kind of a big one, especially where we had the recent heat wave here. So I have got four different temperature sensors in my house telling me about the temperature of my house, um, mainly telling me my aircon's not working very well, which is funny enough. Right now, there's somebody in my garage trying to fix my aircon. Um, but there's everyone has a lot of these IoT devices around them. So some more homework, a little bit of homework for you ready for uh, the office hours and the, rest, and the rest of the series. So just think about what are the benefits and failures of IoT. Have a think about that. And then have a think about things like data privacy, hardware challenges and connectivity. You know, this is kind of self-study time. Have a think about these things. Um, and then you know, we can talk about this in the office hours uh, tomorrow. And then if you want an assignment to do, if you do want an assignment, if you, want, if you really want some homework, then try and find a large scale IoT project and so, you know, find something good on the project and then try and work out the upsides and downsides and we can again we can we can bring this tomorrow we can talk about this during the office hours tomorrow so that's it that's an intro to to the internet of things let me just zip back to any questions um so yes sorry questions 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 do azure have any service similar to iot greengrass from aws um that's a good question. I, I we do, I'm sure. I don't know what Greengrass is. What is Greengrass? That's the edge service, isn't it? AWS Greengrass. Oh yes, um, yes we do. So AWS Greengrass as an IoT edge service. Um, so AWS. They, they 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 have very cool names. What's this? They do have very cool names. Unfortunately, the names are not very descriptive. So their IoT Edge solution, which allows you to run code on Edge devices, um, let me go back to page that. It's called um, AWS Greengrass. It seems we call ours IoT Edge because you know we have boring names that tell you exactly what it is it's kind of yeah do you want a uh, a fun name that's not descriptive or a boring name that's descriptive so yes um azure iot edge so you run this on an iot device so you can, I mean, you can run this on raspberry pi for example and then what you do is you connect it to a container repository and say i want to install this container to run on the edge so you could train a model in the cloud install the iot edge runtime on a raspberry pi or a linux device or what have you and then using the um Using, using Azure, you can say, I want to connect this container to this Edge device and it'll, and it'll push the container to the Edge device and then manage the data flow back and forward. Um, that's actually covered in, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have that picture here. I have the picture, where's the picture? Um, we actually do cover that in, in some of the lessons. So if you want to learn all about it, when we get to manufacturing, uh, later on, lesson 15 onwards, you actually train an AI model in the cloud, deploy that as a container to a container registry, and then run that on an edge device. So if you're using a Raspberry Pi, for example, you can actually run that on the Raspberry Pi doing AI analytics on the edge device. So for those who are not quite sure what I'm talking about, on the edge is all about running your data close to your device. So rather than run, for example, an AI model in the cloud, you can run it on a computer that runs in the same network that your IoT devices in, which means there's less data to send over the internet, less bandwidth usage, uh, less costs for cloud computing, and more privacy because your data doesn't leave your environment. So if you're doing like healthcare imagery, you can run 
an AI model that you train it in the cloud, run on a computer, in your network, in your hospital, and then the images get sent just to that computer. They don't leave your hospital. So you kind of got a lot of privacy there. And because you're running it locally, you're not, if you're doing, say, analytics of live video, you don't want to be streaming, you know, 100 security cameras of full HD video over the internet because that bandwidth is going to be ridiculous. You will instead want to be doing, doing local analytics using edge devices. So it kind of saves on bandwidth, saves on cloud cost. But obviously, you then have to manage the devices yourself. So, yeah, you win, you lose. Awesome. So I think that's. Uh, how is .NET Framework 5 Plus support on IoT devices? Um, Raspberry Pis do support .NET Core. Then they support .NET Framework. It's been a while since I've done the .NET. You can run .NET Core on a Raspberry Pi, and there's a whole load of IoT support for that. Um, So what you can do, I'll just drop this in the uh, in the chat. So yes, there is IoT support for um, for .NET, for .NET Core. It supports Raspberry Pi and a few other boards. It's definitely not as widely supported as uh, you know Arduino. You can't run it on all the different um, microcontrollers. Closest one for that would be Wilderness Labs. So Wilderness make a microcontroller. Uh, in fact, where are we? I have one somewhere. Where is it? Where is it? Here it is. Um, so Chemical Wilderness Labs make a microcontroller. Here it is here. Uh, the F7 Micros. This runs a version of .NET. So it runs, it supports the um, .NET standard or whatever they're calling it these days. Uh, and that, so you, there's a full IoT device that runs using .NET libraries. So you can kind of, you can program certain hardware. So uh, Wilderness Labs, all this nano framework, that's uh, a third party framework that runs on some embedded systems. I haven't done much with this. Uh, I don't know what platforms. Well, it supports ASP32, ST Micro, so it supports, supports a few devices. So there are options if you want to go down the .NET route. Uh, obviously, the, the, the if you go down this route, you've got all the, you've obviously got lots of lovely C, um, you know, .NET libraries, code in C Sharp, hopefully F sharp, because I do love a bit of F sharp, and you obviously get all the benefits of that, but then you don't get the same level of support that you would get with, say, Arduino, C++, or um, you know, the other, the, the more device-owned C and C++ frameworks, because they just have a lot more, more samples out there. Yeah, if you search for Arduino libraries, you get yeah a, a bajillion of them. If you search for .NET libraries, you won't get so many. So there is .NET framework support. Uh, we've had we have had somebody asking whether we can support this entire curriculum with with .NET Core, and uh, no. Nope, but uh, because our curriculum is fully open source, if anybody wanted to rewrite what we've done and port it to .NET Core, they're more than welcome to it um, to do so. And yeah, if you we may even bring that back in if 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 we've got uh, great support. Um, what's the link to the seed? The link to buy everything? Uh, let me just. It's that. Let me just. It was in the chat earlier. Oh, I lost my mouse. I lost my mouse. I'll share it again. Oh, brilliant. Thank it. you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yep. Brilliant. So, yep, so that's been shared in the chat there. Uh, do I need accounting cloud services to complete any of the lessons? So, the first seven lessons we do, you don't need a cloud account. So the, the first seven lessons is all about the basics. We get going with sensors, actuators, and in lesson four, which we'll do uh, next week, we do connect to the cloud just using a free MQTT broker, which is like a messaging platform to send messages around. So all the stuff I'm going to be talking about this week and next week, no, you don't need a cloud service. To complete the whole curriculum, you will need a cloud service from lesson eight onwards. Uh, we use Azure, obviously, you know. We're Microsoft, we, we, we wrote this content, we're gonna be using our cloud services, uh, but you can do everything using the, the free account. So we do have a free Azure account. You sign up for that, you get $200 worth of credit to use in the first 30 days, There's a, plus a hold of free services. And then in terms of the IoT service we use, we'll be, you, you, you'll be within the free tier, so it won't cost you anything for the IoT service. Any AI services you use will be within the free tier. Um, the only time anything might cost you some money is when you do some of the stuff on the edge, you'll need a container, repos a container registry to store a container in, and you might want to spin up a virtual machine to run an edge device if you don't have uh, a Linux environment available. But as long as you spin it up, do the thing and spin it down again, you can complete the whole thing, probably spending no more than one US dollar. 
you know it's it's not much uh, if you need to spend anything but you can I think the cheapest you can get away with doing the whole thing if you've got your own device that you can run the edge thing on I think it's about 16 cents I think it's the cheapest you can do the whole thing on as long as you remember to delete your resources as soon as you finish with them um, awesome cool we've reached in the questions we are pretty much at time uh, so we'll, we'll be back again tomorrow uh, same time different place there's a different link I think for, for tomorrow's one which everyone who registered should have got uh, so tomorrow is all about office hours. So tomorrow, bring your questions. We can go through. We can talk through some of those kind of homeworky bits that I talked about today. I'll show you get started with the Raspberry Pi. Show you get started with the virtual IoT device. And tomorrow to be a bit more casual, um, a bit more fun. Um, but otherwise, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, please fill out the survey. Uh, this is only the first time I've run these series. Uh, for the reactor um, so i would love your feedback about how we can help make this a lot better you know i will be listening to your feedback so please 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 let us know what we're doing well let us know what we can improve i uh, really appreciate it but otherwise thank you everybody for for joining in and um i'll see hopefully see you all tomorrow thank you see you tomorrow